Welcome to the first Coffee and Crescent of the new half term. And as you know, um, this half term, one of the big focuses for us as a school is going to be feedback. OK, and as we are coming out of um, social distancing, out of the pandemic, getting back to normal, how are we going to use feedback to really um, fill those gaps in the knowledge of our students and extend their knowledge moving forward. Um, and so we have got some experts uh, with us today to talk us through this, and they are gonna be talking us through live marking um, from the perspective of English. And then over the next few weeks, we are gonna be looking at um, live marking and feedback in some different areas of the school. Um, so I am gonna introduce the first, Sam Bolger, and then Sam Rogers. It is the Sam tag team, so enjoy. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So firstly, let's go over the rationale for live marking. Ultimately, being able to live mark means that we are helping students make instant progress. The second you give them that target, they know exactly what they need to do to improve. And ultimately, because you're giving them something that's special for them, this will increase student engagement. Um, and the instant feedback also means that when you go back to that student and you see what they've done, they get that instant gratification of knowing that they've made progress, so it helps them stay motivated as well. Um, it also helps us to stop misconceptions, especially when they're starting, for example, in English, a paragraph. If we check those first couple of sentences, we can see immediately if they're on the right track and whether their response is going to be clear or not, and we can guide them in the right direction from there. <clears throat> it's also AFL. Each target is a way to check that they've understood the learning and we are able to make sure that when they sit down to accomplish a task that we are giving them differentiated work you wouldn't give the same target to the whole class if you do notice that you're giving the same target to the whole class probably a good time to stop and readdress the misconception this also helps them with revision making sure that they write down the target helps them go back when they're revising for their exams and understand what are the common mistakes that they've been making. Um, parents and carers are able to track and monitor progress. So parents can look at the book immediately and understand that the teacher is helping that student make progress frequently. Um, and this also really helps lead into learning conversations and dialogues, especially with a lot of our COVID setup right now, we can get students all the way up to the desk, have a quick conversation with them using their fix it and then we can update the KOs right away because we know what targets they've been given. And if they've been able to accomplish it, then they have made progress. Uh, and finally, it's a great way to get to know the strengths and needs of your students, especially if they're doing a creative piece, you might also learn something about their personal, them personally as well. So this is a quick example of what we might do for a top set in English. Ultimately, we prioritize the learning time, so 40 or the writing time, so 45 minutes of detailed writing time. Now, you might want to chunk this for sets who might need a little bit more structure or scaffolding along the way. Um, I also wouldn't recommend giving this many targets to a progress set. Um, there, it's quite wordy. You could cut it down, make it really specific to your class as well. This is sort of a, an overall bank of targets, but you could rewrite them and make it really relevant to what your class needs or the problems that you anticipate with them. And at the bottom, you'll notice there are challenge tasks as well. Even for a progress class, I would always make sure to include a challenge target because this helps them feel motivated and like they're worthy of doing challenges. We don't want to, them to feel like challenges are only for higher sets or the smart students. All of them should have that opportunity. And that's Sam Rogers. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Sam. So I'm just going to talk about how we do this in the English department and elaborate it on a little bit more. Um, so as you can see here, I've written down from Sam's last slide here, where she's got the T codes. We would normally display the T codes on the board. And then what we would do is we'd write down, for example, T5. And then I would actually turn that into a question. I find it a lot easier for students to engage with if it's a question, they can simply respond to it. And then when we have time in the next lesson, I can go back, check they've responded to it and then give them further feedback. You can see an example of it just here on the right hand side. Um, so I've written the T code there. I've given them rewrite this um, and include two contrasting ideas. And then underneath they've responded and I've gone back again and given them another target based on that response. So essentially, if we zoom in a little bit more, um, 
two codes are used in conjunction with the ones displayed on the board. So kids have got a clear reference point. They can keep going back to what you've given them. Um, two codes are converted into questions that the student can respond to. Um, it allows the teacher to zoom in on the child's progress. So for example, if I've given them that question, I know that they need to work on this specific area and I can track the progress, which then translates into me monitoring their progress on the DPR. Um, if we look over here as well, I can actually correct their misconceptions straight away and actually make them more independent learners. So they're able to reflect on their learning and have a look at, okay, I'm not very good at this particular aspect. I know I need to work on this. And then next time I can work and focus on this area. Normally the way that we do it in English is we have a double period. And in the second half, we'll give them, as Sam explained earlier, a 45 minute task to get on with. And then we'll go down row by row, targeting those students in particular that we haven't looked at, or particularly our pathway S students in that class, if we've got the progress group, we might want to look at the most able students in the top set. And we'll go through each row and actually take the books back to the desk, have a look at them, and then give them back to the student and provide that instant feedback. So key takeaways, and then I'll hand back to Sam Bolger as well. Um, so I think it's a good idea to actually plan and consider what you will mark in advance, rather than just sort of thinking, okay, I'm in the lesson now, I'll just mark that paragraph. Think about what do you want the students to actually take away from that lesson? And what do you actually want them to learn from your marking? Um, it's call and response really, ask those questions. It's easier for students to respond to and create that dialogue in their books. I think what LG are looking for, particularly post holders who come into your lessons, they're looking for that dialogue between the teacher and the student. They don't just wanna see, okay, the teacher's marking the books and putting in all that effort. Where's the response from the student? How is it actually helping them? Um, use the challenge T codes that Sam went through earlier. I mean, I know English are doing them. I know some of the other core departments are doing them, but it might be an idea if as a school, we could actually start to use challenge T codes just to stretch those students in our classes and think about, am I marking in the most effective way? Um, so for example, are you spending too long going around looking at books where you could focus on a specific paragraph, a, spe a specific area or an equation? Um, have I worked out a plan for which students I will cover or at the moment, or am I just doing it ad hoc? Um, and do pathway S students need some sentence starters to respond to your comments? So for example, it's very easy as a teacher just to think, okay, I've given these comments, the student can respond, but sometimes particularly with those pathway S students, they might need that extra bit of support. I'm gonna hand back to Sam Bolger for some more key takeaways. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so just a couple of tips that I've learned over the years that really help with um, maximizing your timings. Firstly, when you are doing live marking, it's easy to miss students. So what I want you to think about is how are you going to catch up with those students? Now, if you're like me and have a terrible memory for these things, you might want to consider just doing a quick slant and then saying all students who have two pieces of extended writing that have not been marked, please put up your hands and you are my priority today. So you would mark their books and your staff students books, making sure that you don't have any gaps. It's so easy when a student's away to miss that student because you marked their row last lesson. The other thing is when they're doing their fix it, sometimes they run out of time. So sometimes I will direct them during starter time actually fix it comes first. It is the most important thing you will ever do in lesson is your fix it. So I want you to use that starter time to make sure your fix it is in quality. So those are my two big tips for you when doing live marking. And that's all I have to say. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Sam and Sam. Um, so some really, really interesting things there. I, I really like the idea of, um, in integrating your DPR and your live grading of your KOs along with your, your, your live marking. Um, that really makes sense to me. So if you've got the kids book there, they've brought it out to your desk, you've seen that they've done what you've asked them to do, you change that grade as part of your phase three, the independent task, that's up on the board. And then all of a sudden the kid sees that progress happening straight away. Um, because of course, what we wanna do here is we wanna get rid of retrospective marking. One of the main purposes of this, as well as it being extremely effective um, way of giving feedback is that we wanna make work workload less. OK, and so by integrating these systems into your normal teaching practice, that's going to really help you. Um, uh, for me, in a foundation subject, we don't have um, the independent written task every lesson. So we have 
um, kind of an exam skills lesson, if you like. And in that one lesson out of the three uh, periods that we have a week, we do um, our written work. And so for us, some of those tips that Sam was saying there at the end, whereby you ask the students to tell you which books you live marked last time, um, you, you know, you've got an eye on your SAF students, obviously. Those little tips are really, really important for us moving forward, because what we want to see is that there is regular live marking going on in any selection of books that we pick up, okay? And that doesn't mean that every piece of writing has to be um, live marked. That's impossible. But what we do want to see is that there is some system into your, into your, into your process of how you're doing your live marking in your lesson. Um, so in, in a few weeks' time, we're going to be doing quite an in-depth look into everyone's books. So this is a really good opportunity um, to now make sure we're really focusing on, on live marking in our phase three and making sure that we're getting our books um, to where we need them to be to ensure that we are helping our pupils as much as we can um, moving forward through live marking and moving away from retrospective marking. Um, listen, I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope that was uh, useful to you. Um, next week, we're going to be having a look at um, live marking in some different subject areas. So maths areas, science areas, where it's slightly different. We don't we don't have the T codes. Um, oh, one last thing I should say that I really, really thought was really 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 important actually um sam rogers sam was saying about um uh putting some context on your t code it's really hard for when i go around and i look at someone's book and it just says t3 and then you've got the response um it's hard for me to see okay so what what actually was that target what did they want the kid to do but just by turning that into a little question and putting a few words next to that t code all of a sudden it's really easy now the purpose of that isn't that I know what's happening when I come into your lesson. It's when a kid goes back to that T code in three months time, six months time as part of their revision process or part of their memory recall, it gives them a trigger so that they can see, oh, that, that was my area of development and that's how I fix that area of development. So that's a really, really important point. Don't just put the T code and nothing else, put it into some sort of context. It really helps the kid um, and it really shows that you're having that, that interactive dialogue. Listen, have a brilliant weekend. Um, thank you.